Hi, Alex. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Um, how are you? I'm doing okay. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. You are Alex Massey in England, and you write a lot for a lot of people, notably including The Spectator, mm -hmm. which might suggest to people that uh, you are among those who is... Uh, most most kind of torn up about this uh, this Margaret Thatcher thing. Maybe you're still in a period of grieving. I don't know. Well, I mean, obviously, I thought about uh, you know white shirt, black tie for recording this, but I think uh, yeah. you know, uh, no. I mean, half the half the country's in mourning, and the other half is celebrating. Uh, you mean, are I, not I, celebrating. But, uh, no, but um, well, I mean, you're celebrating her legacy, pretty right yeah, to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I think. Um, I mean, Thatcher, what, we, what, we've, what we've discovered, I think, anew in Britain today, or been reminded of this week, is just how consequential a prime minister she was, uh, mm -hmm. how she was not someone you could ignore. Um, you know, Tony Blair, like Margaret Thatcher, won three election victories. But Blair's legacy, at this stage anyway, um, will not be anything like as great. His impact on British politics will not be a, was not anything like... Uh, Margaret Thatcher's. Mm -hmm. um, she, I mean, in many ways, Blair was the heir to Thatcher. He accepted large parts of the Thatcherite settlement, and he didn't actually put Britain onto a new path, particularly himself. Um, you know, in, in this respect, uh, you know, Blair was a c comparable in some ways to Bill Clinton, uh, and Thatcher, obviously, the, 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 to is compared with Reagan uh, in mm -hmm. terms of their their um, impact. But uh, you know, it's not just in, in Britain. You know, you you look at the front pages of newspapers around the world, um, and they're dominated by the news of Thatcher's death. And yeah. there are very few uh, politicians anywhere. Uh, in the world who get that sort of reaction upon their death, um, uh, you know, whether it's in the United States, in France, in Germany, um, Argentina, um, even China. You know, Thatcher's death was, was something that registered and uh, you know, on, on the front pages of newspapers all around the world um, mm -hmm. in ways that is, is, you know, that are unusual, especially in, um, in this day and age where, you know, Britain is not a, a particularly large country, but it was a measure of, of her international significance and reputation, her clout, uh, whether for better or, or for worse, that she provoked this sort of reaction. I mean, she wasn't yeah. a politician you could ignore. Um, you couldn't do that when she was alive. And as it turns out, you can't do it when she's dead either. Uh -huh. And in a way, it's kind of ironic because, I mean, you, you know, we think of her as somebody who, who steered Britain considerably to the right. And yet, from an American perspective, Britain... Britain still might seem like, uh, you know, the, uh, the socialist hell that people on the right think about, in the sense that yeah. at least it has truly socialized medicine, which is what, you know, what, what some people on the American right would think, you know, w w is beyond the point of no return to have, to have that kind of thing. So I mm -hmm. guess to appreciate her legacy in domestic policy, you need to have some appreciation of what Britain was like before her, which I don't have a super clear appreciation of, I guess. Now, and you are probably too young to clearly remember yeah. that, right? When do you, when, when do your memories, your clear memories pick up? Yeah, well, I mean, I was born in 1974, which was the year before she became leader of the mm -hmm. Conservative Party. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, of course, was a, an unexpected victory. Uh, you know, and at the time, you know, you, you, Britain was a, a, a very different place then. Obviously, in the Conservative Party, it was a very different place. It was still dominated by grandees, um, old white men, many of them from privileged and aristocratic backgrounds. Uh, and, and here was this grocer's daughter from provincial Lincolnshire, um, daring to, to suggest that she could be uh, not just leader of the but, Conservative Party, but, but leader just... of, the, of, of the Prime Minister. You know, that was, a, that, was a, that was almost a shocking development. Um, uh, but can I just say, from an American perspective, one thing about her is she had, maybe this d d speaks to the crudeness of American stereotypes, but she seemed to have such an aristocratic manner herself, right? Well, she, she was certainly she, haughty, I think you could say, uh, you know, and, and, you know, convinced that she was right. Yes, I mean, she had, uh, uh, you know, but she, her image was softened. She um, And what was that accent? What kind of accent? That's not like a, like a Liverpool accent, right? Where did, no, what, what was that no, about? No, well, she, she had quite a lot of work done um, on her voice. Um, okay. You know, she, she got some voice coaching just to, uh, to try and soften some of her um, tones and, and be a more convincing um, uh, you know, performer oh, on television. She had um, me fooled, I'll yeah. tell you. Um, but, no, I mean, I mean, you're right in terms of, um, 
you know, that, that Britain is a more, in, in some ways, is a more left-wing society than the United States. But the, you know, uh, and, and you're right that she she did not dismantle uh, the National Health Service, um, nor did she, in fact, dismantle the welfare state at all. Um, you know, the Labour spent the whole of the 1980s arguing that, you know, we have 24 hours to save the NHS and so on, but it was never actually seriously under threat. And they say the same, of course, now in David Cameron's government, but nobody is challenging uh, the idea that healthcare should be free at the point of use. Uh, mm -hmm. There are various other things that are, are, are uh, you know, in the works in terms of reforming how it is delivered, but the essential principle of the NHS remains unchallenged. And it's, you know, the NHS has become a kind of secular religion, um, particularly for middle class Britain. And uh, as a result of that, you know, it is, it is very difficult to actually do anything about it. Uh, so what, it, it, what did she dismantle or what did she change? Well, you have to remember, in the 1970s, Britain was a basket case. People were thinking that Britain was ungovernable. Uh, the trade unions, uh, the, particularly the coal miners, had essentially brought down Ted Heath's government in 1974. Um, uh, inflation rarely dipped below 10% for a decade. Uh, at some points in the 1970s, it actually r rose above 25%. Uh, huge swathes of the British economy were owned and mismanaged by uh, the state. Uh, it is quite astonishing when you look at uh, a list of the privatizations that uh, took place in the Thatcher era to realize just how extensive state ownership of industry and uh, other parts of the economy was. I and mean, it wasn't just British steel. It wasn't just the mines. It wasn't mm -hmm. just British airways or the utilities, gas, electricity, British airways. Uh, the, the state owed, uh, owned um, a chain of hotels. Uh, uh, the state owned. Uh, How were they? Uh, How were they? I guess you never stayed in one. Huh? The, the food. The food was not perhaps um, great. Uh, shall we say? I mean, Britain in the 1970s had no sort of you know, culinary uh, reputation. Uh, you know, the state owned uh, the production of sugar was nationalised. British sugar was a, a state-owned enterprise. Um, there was even. Um, a firm called Pickford, uh, the most well-known removals firm. I, if you're moving house, you know, you, you call Pickford's. Uh, uh, they were actually owned by the state. Um, but but, but, know, was there in, but um, in a lot of these realms, there was competition from the private sector. There were private sector hotels, right? Oh, yeah, uh, sure, sure. I mean, you, you know, it yeah. wasn't East Germany. Um, right. But, uh, you, you know, one of the telling things, if, if you look at the pr productivity, you know, by the time Thatcher left office, Britain was producing just as much steel as it did in 1979 when she um, entered office. But mm. uh, there were five times as many people employed by the steel industry in 1979 as there were in 1990. Now, you know, that's one isolated example of, of just how unproductive British industry had become, how sclerotic. Um, Britain was, you know, uh, there were other other things, you know, you, you couldn't take more than 500 pounds out of the country when you went abroad, there were currency mm -hmm. controls, um, uh, you know, the, the, the country had had to receive a bailout from the IMF um, uh -huh. in the mid-1970s. So is, it, is there consensus? Uh, you know, so there, there was, you know, Britain was in decline, people, people you, know, you know, Time magazine and Newsweek and so on referred to Britain as the sick man of Europe. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, there was a, a pervasive sense of, of decline, of defeat, um, of fatalism. And she saw her role principally as challenging that, as, as saying that, you know, uh, it did not have to be this way. Britain could actually uh, reorganize itself, reform itself. Um, and become a leading nation in the world uh, in the world again, uh, and mm -hmm. that was that was really her, her challenge. You know, her her achievements are not measured in legislation, uh, really. Um, if you compare her record with the Attlee government of the 1945-1950 period, which is the other significant uh, post-war premiership. Uh, you know, Attlee's government passed an awful lot of legislation uh, that was truly significant. They set up the National Health Service and so on. Um, Thatcher's legislative achievements were somewhat slighter, but it, her, her impact was in getting government out of the way in many ways, and it was about changing the tone and the ambition of British politics. Um, you know, it is, it is it's quite striking, you know, actually, if, you know, in 2013, it's now, uh, what, 34 years since Thatcher took office in 1979. 
uh, and she took office 34 years after Clement Attlee uh, came to power in 1945, which is a neat um, coincidence, obviously, that, uh, that the, mm -hmm. you know, that these things divide so neatly in half. But, but really, yes, you have um, the Attlee era, which lasted, broadly speaking, until 1979, and since then we've been living in the Thatcher era. Mm. So right now in England, as, as you work this thing through, is there kind of consensus that she helped generate prosperity, but, but disagreement over kind of the cost of the prosperity, in particular in terms of income inequality? Is that, is that the argument that, okay, granted the economy as a whole got a boost, but it came at the expense of lower income people. I mean, I know that, that her, her, her pitch was kind of the opposite. It was that there's been this ruling class that has held, you know, uh, energetic, entrepreneurial uh, people down. And, 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 you know, this is we, we want to give everyone equal opportunity. But uh, I assume not everyone is, uh, is swallowing that line right now as you work through her legacy. No. Um, you know, if you... There's an opinion poll uh, produced uh, yesterday that suggested that 50% of people felt that she had changed Britain for the better, and 34% said that she had changed Britain markedly for the worse. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, that's across the whole of the UK. Uh, in Scotland, uh, only 23% of people felt that she'd changed Britain for the better. Uh, I, I, th I suspect the numbers would be similar in the north of England. But are, are you... Are well. you, you know, are, yeah, you in so, Scotland, yeah. are you in Scotland now? Yeah, yeah. Did, did I, did in, in I misintroduce you at the beginning? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, uh, the, um, you know, so her, her legacy is divided. You know, there, there will never be consensus on Margaret Thatcher. And it wasn't uh -huh. just because inequality rose in her, during her reign. Um, uh, you know, the rich did. I think you could, you could make an argument that um, on balance, everybody actually was better off, but that the rich were more better off, if you like, than the poor. Mm -hmm. um, and there were large parts of the country where um, her impact or the impact of her policies uh, proved disastrous. Um, you know, uh, and I think even her staunchest defenders um, should have the honesty to admit that. And wh the, what, is the, what, what is the most disastrous effect? Uh, the most disastrous effect was that while British heavy industry probably had to it was going to decline anyway, um, uh, shipbuilding, steel working, coal mining, uh, large parts of manufacturing. So uh, we're going to the car industry. We're going to have to decline. They could not live on state subsidies forever. Uh, but uh, what, what happened in large parts of the north of England, the west of Scotland, south Wales, was that, okay, heavy industry was essentially destroyed uh, and nothing replaced it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the failure to realize that um, that something would have to be done to, to replace these lost jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. And she, worse than that, it was that she didn't seem to care, or at least it was, it was easy to perceive or to get the idea that she didn't really care. There was a mm -hmm. relish with which she took on her opponents um, that in, in one sense was admirable because some of them were, were you know, uh, overmighty trades unions that needed to be curbed, um, that needed to be defeated. But at the same time, the, the relish with which she did so um, was seen by many people as, as sort of pushing their faces into the dirt, if you like, mm -hmm. um, in a way that was perhaps unseemly. Uh, you know, that it wasn't just, she didn't just require victory, she required total victory. Mm -hmm. uh, now, and, and that came at a, at a significant cost. I mean, there are still parts of Britain that haven't really recovered from the 1980s, um, where, uh, you know, the legacy of industrial decline has not been arrested. Um, you know, uh, the jobs haven't come to replace them. And so you have these, these broken communities still where welfare dependency is, cripple, is, is a crippling blight, where, and, and all the programs, all the, all the things that are associated with that. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, while, while most of Britain did well under, under her, um, and, and many of the reforms she introduced were, I think, necessary in terms of liberalizing the economy, uh, it came at quite a, quite a significant price, and one that was terribly heavy to bear uh, in, in some places. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that, that, that again, is one of the reasons why she's so controversial. Um, you know, she was not an un, a, a force for unmitigated good. Um, but there, then again, you know, the notion of her as, a, as some sort of witch is also a terrible caricature. <laughs> um, you know, um, she's, it's a complicated legacy. Um, you know, she wasn't a simplistic politician. Um, or, or in one way, she was. I mean, she was, she was very sure of what she uh, knew, and she mm -hmm. did not brook dissent um, uh, terribly kindly. Um, but, you know, she was not, uh, you know, if you, people talk about, you know, say her 1981 budget, which is a very famous budget, actually increased taxes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she was not um, uh, a Reaganite, every tax cut pays for itself um, type well, of Well, and, and even Reagan wound up increasing yeah. the taxes and yeah. is commonly acknowledged. It, 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 tell me about um, the European Union. Was she the, the beginning, her administration, the beginning of what became a more or less enduring British resistance to deep integration in the EU, at least, you know, deep enough to include the, the currency union? And um, mm -hmm. in which case, I, I, I would think that's something that's, that's been discussed lately or not? Yeah, oh, yeah, very much so. I mean, in terms of the single currency, she was right. You know, she warned that and, the single that's currency... The that's, um, a that's a consensus. That's more or less a consensus in Britain now that she got that one right. The constituency for British membership of the euro um, is <laughs> tiny. You could fit them into a couple of London taxis. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whereas, you know, the late 1980s and the early 1990s, uh, there was significant parts of the British opinion, the B particularly in the BBC and the Guardian, um, uh, even in the large parts of the Conservative Party, or a wing of the Conservative Party, that thought Britain should join the single currency. Uh, much of the Labour Party was on, uh, in favour of it as well. Um, but it was a combination, if you like, of, of Margaret Thatcher and Rupert Murdoch, um, who helped um, ensure that that wouldn't happen. Uh, but even on Europe, um, it's... It's complicated. It's more nuanced than the caricature would suggest. You know, in 1975, uh, when there was a referendum, uh, you know, uh, on, on um, so not 75 before that, there was a referendum on Britain re re remaining uh, within the uh, European Economic Communities, it was then. And it, most of the opposition to British membership of the U EEC then were, actually came from the left. Uh, it was the Labour mm. Party that was split on Europe then. Uh, Thatcher um, campaigned in front of banners saying Conservatives for Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. But she saw it as a uh, single market, and that, that should be it really, a union of nation states um, rather than a federal um, Euro union or a European super state, which is what she greatly feared. Uh, you know, in this sense, she was, she was actually, and, and in many others actually, you know, the figure with which she's... Uh, perhaps comparable is, is Charles de Gaulle. Uh, she was, uh, her, her view of Europe was, um, was quite Gaullist, uh, albeit she was also terribly suspicious of the French. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was very English in that sense, uh, that well, the French could not be trusted. Um, and I would guess uh, that one distinction was she was probably pretty wholeheartedly in favor of the reduction in trade barriers entailed by the EU, whereas yeah, the yeah. Gaullists were probably more suspicious yes. of even that. Yes. And I think where, where she got uh, upset was when uh, you started getting regulation, um, yeah. you know, more uh, kind of affirmative regulation of commerce, which some people would say is entailed logically by freer trade. But anyway, leave that argument well, aside. Well, it, it is to some degree, um, mm -hmm. yes. But she, you know, she was a free marketeer. Um, you know, that that was what she believed in. Um, she. Um, and, and she felt really that that was all that Europe needed to be. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, yes, she had a fundamentally different vision of what Europe should be uh, to that that uh, you find in Brussels um, or indeed Paris or Bonn, now Berlin. Um, uh, so, you know, yes, the, the, the divides over Europe um, ended up costing her, damaging her enormously. They were a huge part of why she was eventually toppled, defenestrated right? by the Conservative Party. Yeah, it was divides over, over, over Europe in, in many ways that um, uh, cost her the support of Geoffrey Howe, who had been uh, cha first Chancellor, mm -hmm. then Foreign Secretary, and then ultimately Deputy Prime Minister. And he resigned um, largely over differences about Europe and the style of Thatcher's government. It was increasingly regal, um, uh, mm -hmm. intolerant of even internal dissent within the Cabinet. Um, and he, de he delivered a, a devastating resignation speech in the House of Commons, um, that's still famous to this day, uh, and always will be, actually, in the, uh, when people contemplate resignation speeches. Um, and that 
was the thing that then um, uh, opened the room for Michael Heseltine to challenge Thatcher for the for the Tory party's leadership, um, and uh, and she was ultimately defeated. I mean, Th Heseltine himself didn't become leader; John Major did, but. Uh, it was this, um, and this, but this act of regicide. Um, you know, there are still Tory MPs at Westminster who, who think it is too painful to talk about uh, this period in the party's history. Hmm. Um, it was prompted by concerns over Europe, and overall a fear that things had just, just gone too far, that she was out of touch with the British people, and that um, she was going to in, in grave danger of losing the next general election. Uh, and so they, they, uh, the Tory Party, which has always been a ruthless beast. Um, uh, uh, threw her out the window uh, before the electorate had the chance to do so. Hmm. Um, I, but I the divisions over, you know, the divisions, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, still exist in many ways. And, and, and you're right that no subsequent Tory leader um, has really been able to reconcile exactly how to keep Britain a member of the European Union on its own terms, as um, you know. Um, you know, Cameron is now promising a referendum on, on continuing British membership and talking about renegotiating the terms of that membership. Uh, I'm not quite sure how he can really do that. Um, uh, but, you know, there we are. It's, you know, the Tory party is now solidly Eurosceptic, but then so is, in general terms, much of British opinion. You know, the, the, the Britain wants to be a member of the EU, but it doesn't really want the EU to be anything more than just a free trade agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, on, in, the, in the realm of uh, foreign policy, um, mm -hmm. A couple of things she did, and I, I think you could see a little irony here. <clears throat> she, on the one hand, gave Hong Kong back to China, or at least arranged for that to happen. Well, she, well, she was, didn't have any choice in that. It was a treaty. Um, you know, we only had a 99-year lease on Hong Kong. So, okay, is that, um, that was due? You know, was that due to expire in yeah. 1997? When? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, so there was no, there was no, there was no choice there. No. Why? No, sadly not. So what was actually negotiated? There was something negotiated, just just how exactly it would do, the change of hands would take place? Yeah, and um, what uh, what we saw in, in, in her years was moves to actually establish a, um, something akin to a proper democratic system of governance for Hong Kong mm. in the hope that the Chinese would not then dismantle that. Um, Which is to some extent, I guess, um, I mean, Hong Kong remains kind of an outlier. Yeah. It, it, it's culturally distinct from... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you could argue has had has had what we in the West would call a positive influence on on China more than more than China has had a negative influence on it. I don't know. I think so, but then you know that's capitalism. Yeah. That is capitalism. So anyway, in terms of things she did not give back to countries, and there is the Falkland Islands. Yeah. Um, a, a war Her that I've hour. heard. <laughs> what's what's that? Her finest hour. A, a, a war that I've heard compared to two bald men fighting over a comb. I mean, you know, the actual islands are not like a major asset, right? No, um, no. Um, but she saw it in very principled terms that yeah. um, the people of the Falkland Islands, which is part of which is British territory and recognised as such by international law, um, there is no no doubt of, of that, uh, were and wished to remain uh, British. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, for her, it was a simple matter of principle, um, or two principles: one, upholding uh, British sovereignty. And secondly, actually, yes, upholding international law, uh, that, um, you know, uh, that the Argentine invasion um, was um, something that uh, was intolerable. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so, yes, she, she dispatched a task force to retake the islands, um, which, you know, uh, was quite an adventure. Um, I you know, remember they're, 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 they're 8,000 miles away, um, you know, uh, and this was, you know, in the era before you had stealth bombers that could fly to the other side of the world. Um, uh, yeah, although, you know, I think it was, if I'm recalling correctly, I think it was almost the debut, at least the, the of any prominence, of kind of smart weapons. I believe the British were using these French Exocet missiles? Or no, 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 no. That was the Argentinians who were using the French Exocet missiles. Oh, really? To, to sink a number of British ships, yeah. Um, oh. Uh, so, so the British used torpedoes to do the whatever it was, the Belgrano or Belgrano or uh, whatever? Was, yeah. Um, yeah, the Belgr oh. Belgrano was an uh, Argentine battleship, was, was uh, a battle cruiser was sunk um, uh, controversially. Because so the Argentinians had, the had the smart the time, weapons. But, well, no, no, it wasn't so much that they had smart weapons, but, but they had a number of French Exocet missiles, the right. mes missiles that they had bought from the French. They hadn't been supplied uh -huh. to them by the French as a, as a sort right. of, you know, uh, you know, here's some assistance while 
while you're batting, battling perfidious Albion. Um, I mean, in actual fact, the French were very useful um, uh, allies to Britain um, behind the scenes during the Falklands. Mm -hmm. uh, Falklands okay. um, but it was, it, was, it was a big gamble. Um, she was not on her own in taking it, um, but there were senior members of the cabinet and indeed even within the armed forces that were not sure that this was um, the, the, the thing to do. Uh, and did um, the American administration, the Reagan administration, was very skeptical right. about it initially. Um, Alexander Haig, um, you know, felt that uh, this was a misguided um, uh, adventure. Gene Patrick, who was uh, at, uh, at the United Nations, I think, still at the mm -hmm. United Nations at the time, was essentially pro-Argentine. Um, uh, you know, uh, Reagan himself was a little wobbly on it uh, until he received a, a stern talking to, and then the United States, um, you know, did supply, you know, behind the scenes support as well. And it was um, a huge political winner in, in Britain. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, it it, uh, uh, it transformed her. her her prospects in, in some respects. I mean, there'd been a damaging and deep recession. There'd been a lot of rioting um, in the inner cities in, in um, London and Birmingham and Liverpool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, 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 the country was, was not in the happiest of places. And then the, but the, you know, the Argent, the Falklands War became a great rallying point. Um, I mean, she was fortunate in some ways as well. I mean, the opposition was in, in terribly divided in 1983 at the 1983 election, which followed mm -hmm. soon after the war. Um, uh, the uh, Labour Party um, produced uh, a manifesto that was reasonably um, uh, labelled the longest suicide note in political history, mm -hmm. uh, and that obviously helped turn the, uh, you know. But but the Falklands the Falklands War was was a key turning point, not just in terms of of, of winning the the war, and the, the, that was a notable achievement because obviously if Britain had lost or it had gone disastrously wrong, um, then that would have been the end of her. Um, mm. uh, but because it had other consequences as well. After it, she, she had a new confidence, a new certainty, um, which given that she had not previously been noted for her lack of confidence or lack of certainty uh, was, was quite something. Uh, you know, she became even more convinced that she was right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, in, in many of her um, you know, reforms actually then came after the Falklands War. Um, mm -hmm. You know, her great battle with the uh, mine unions, the mine workers, the National Union of Miners, um, came after the Falklands War and was, was seen then within the government and, and uh, externally as being, if you like, a domestic version of the Falklands War, mm -hmm. um, that the miners had to be broken. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that, that was a battle that lasted a year. Um, it was immensely divisive and difficult and controversial uh, and brutal. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, for which many people on the left have, have yet to forgive her, and I think even her admirers have to admit that although it was necessary to tame the mining unions, um, the manner in which it was done was was quite regrettable um, in some respects, or at least it certainly had some adverse consequences. What should she have done differently? Um, she could have done. She could, she could have gone more slowly um, mm -hmm. in in some ways. Um, but then she her hand was forced to some degree because the miners called an illegal strike. Um, you know, they, they they cut their own throats in some ways. Uh, again, she was lucky that the mining the miners' mm -hmm. leaders were so remarkably stupid. Um, yeah. Well, the Reagan uh, parallel of somewhat of roughly the same time, I guess, is is of course the airport workers who were. Mm -hmm. Who were from being government, you know, uh, who, 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 whose strike was inherently illegal because they were not, you know, they were a particular kind of worker and, and mm. the deal was they were not supposed to strike. Yeah. That happened a lot faster, but it left a certain amount of uh, bitterness. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a turning point, certainly, in, 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 in Reagan's um, uh, administration, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, their relationship was quite odd, of course, because, again, you know, they're both. They're both recalled as, as these titans, um, uh, and in some respects that's reasonable. Um, but the uh, and there is a new fascination with Thatcher certainly on, on the um, uh, within the Tory Party. But there isn't quite the same. You know, the answer to any given question is to ask what would Margaret have done, and mm -hmm. then divine from that. Well, this is what we should do. Uh, there is, I think, perhaps a slightly greater um, appreciation in uh, the Conservative Party. This is not actually 1979 anymore uh, than there is in the Republican Party, for whom the cult of Reagan, uh, although perhaps not quite as, um, uh, 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 as strong as it was a few years ago, remains, I think, extraordinarily strong, doesn't it? 
I think so. I mean, my sense is almost that Thatcher's death is a bigger deal in Britain than Reagan's death was here, although it was a pretty big deal. Um, mm -hmm. but, but I don't know. Uh, the, the, the relationship was interesting. W what are they saying there? I mean, w one thing that I think Reagan is falsely credited with here is like ending the Cold War. W what are they, and I could elaborate on why I think that's not, <laughs> not the case, but what are they saying about Thatcher's role um, in, in that same event? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I would agree with you that, that you know, put it this way, uh, if, if you say that Reagan and Thatcher ended the Cold War, uh, then that's fine. But they couldn't have done it without Gorbachev, uh, and um, you know his. Uh, you know there's a re there was a reason beyond the fact that um, you know the Nobel people uh, doubtless considered Reagan and Thatcher politically unsound. But there is a reason why Gorbachev got the Nobel Prize and they did not. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, no Gorbachev, no ending of the Cold War, um, whereas it might have ended. Well, or not a grace, not a yeah. graceful yeah. ending, maybe. Yeah, exactly. and, and maybe, but, maybe here but, I should elaborate on why I think Reagan is falsely yeah. credited. You know, I was, if if any empire was ever destined to collapse sooner or later, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I was in Russia during the very early Gorbachev years, so I was kind of seeing what economy mm -hmm. he had inherited, and I went to the finest department store in what is now called St. Petersburg. I think mm -hmm. maybe then it was still called Leningrad. Yeah. I'm not sure. Um, and you would go to the home appliance section where we would find washing machines, and all they had was washing boards. I yeah. mean, really. And, and you would go to where we would buy TVs, and behind their glass counters, what you would see is like vacuum tubes that people would buy to go repair their own TVs with vacuum tubes, you know, well after yeah. we had progressed into the solid state era of electronics. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. place, you couldn't get, like on any given day, you are you know, you just might wake up and find there was no milk available. I mean, it was incredible. There was, there, there were the longest lines to get the most meager foodstuffs. It was, it was incredible. And, and that's why I just think, it's like, you know, the idea that we had to invade Grenada or something, you know, to, to well, really you know, Thatcher, Thatcher push them over furious. the edge, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Thatcher they was were furious, doomed. They were course, doomed. And, um, Thatcher was furious with Reagan when he um, invaded Grenada. It was one of the was she? Had a yeah, because Grenada was a Commonwealth country, a uh, mm. you know, former British colony, and the Americans had invaded um, <laughs> without even a phone call to um, uh, the UK. Uh, to say that this is what we're going to do. Uh, Her Majesty the Queen was also, it, it is believed, displeased by this. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and, and also, you know, Grenada? Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, it was a preposterous it, piece it, of uh, adventurism. Um, but Thatcher's, Thatcher's importance in terms of Gorbachev uh, and, and Reagan was that she was probably the, fir the first to say, uh, as, as, she's, she, as she said after one of her initial meetings with Gorbachev, this is a man with whom we can do business. Right. Uh, and that was important because it gave, it helped, I think, give Reagan um, some space um, when confronting the hawks within, uh, in Washington. That, you know, actually, well, you know, if, if Thatcher says that, you know, this is a guy we should talk to and th interesting things may be about to happen, then, you know, then this is, this is not a crazy, you know, um, peacenik, liberal um, kind of notion or agenda. Uh -huh. so, so I think that that was, that was, that was one of her, her, her important roles. Um, you know, her foreign policy record is, is quite mixed. Um, you know, she, she was right about the Soviet Union. She was right about Gorbachev. Uh, you know, she is, she is still seen in, you know, in Poland and the Czech Republic and so on, uh, or at least by conservatives in Poland and the Czech Republic as being a great heroine, uh, a great uh, one of the people who certainly helped end the Cold War. Um, against that, she was badly wrong on South Africa. Um, her, yeah. friendship, her friendship with uh, Pinochet, Pinochet in Chile was, was unfortunate. Yeah. Well, Although, I mean, again, but that was, that was at least in part because Pinochet had, been, uh, had offered assistance during the Falklands <laughs> War. So there was, there was a reason for that. But against that, you know, uh, the, her victory in the Falklands War also, I think, helped, well, it helped bring down the uh, military junta in Argentina. And that, in turn, I think, helped make... Um, yeah, helped spell the the end for military dictatorships in other parts of Latin America mm -hmm. as well. Uh, it helped it, it helped demonstrate how uh, they were not the answer. Um, but, so uh, so that was perhaps, if you like, an unintended consequence of her foreign policy. But it was part of it. Uh, you know, so so it, it, it's mixed, like all of her legacy. But, it, I, but I think there's a kind of coherence to it in the sense that although she is often depicted as this fearless champion of liberty, 
she was in many ways a realist in yeah. foreign policy, yeah, and, and 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 that's and and this business of we can do business with with Mr. Gorbachev is actually a good example of that. You know, she she said explicitly, look. He's, you know, the guy's not a Democrat, okay? Yeah, he, but he's the best he, we've he's got. He's got his system of government. Than else we've got have. ours. Yeah. We can, well, that's classic realism. Yeah. She and was also similarly, conservative. And, and the same with with South Africa, with Chile, whatever. I mean, she may have have, have turned out to to bet badly on them, but it was again a case where she wasn't going to pass any judgments. You know, it's like. Yeah. No. Uh, so that's kind of the irony, and, and and I don't know is is it being appreciated in Britain that actually she was just a realist and and she was very selective in her uh, in her advocacy of freedom on the international stage. Well, uh, selective in her advocacy, I think, is, is is putting it a little unfairly. I think she was um, she was very much in favor of the, um, of these things in areas where she felt she could do something about it. Uh, mm -hmm. She was less concerned by it in parts of the world where she felt there was no material British interest um, and, frankly, very little that Britain could actually do. Um, mm -hmm. you know, so, so Suharto in, in Indonesia is an example of the latter camp. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, she, uh, in, in, in Europe and, and other places and so on, she, you know, where, where British concerns were more intimately uh, involved, she did have... Um, a useful impact, I think. Uh, so you could say selective, um, but I think I'd, I'd prefer your what you previously said, realist. Um, you know, mm. she was not a utopian in that respect. No. Um, uh, and you know, politics and leadership is complicated mm. and, um, and often and, paradoxical. And um, you know, and, and she was no exception to that. One ideal you might be able to say she did fairly consistently stand up for, and this is actually not uncharacteristic of realists often. Is actually international law. Yeah. Uh, another thing she's given. Uh, I mean, well, Kuwait. Ku you know. Kuwait. I was going to bring up yeah. Kuwait. I mean, that was that was a violation of international laws, transborder aggression. It was ultimately addressed in a manner consistent with international law. Mm -hmm. That is through the Security Council, which uh, which you know. But she was keen uh, that it should go through the Security Council. Right, um, and she is credited with putting steel in George Bush's spine yeah, on that. Again, I think there's, there's a chance that he, that he might not have done anything about yeah. it. Uh, had she not uh, intervened, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, she she saw this as being, you know, like the Falklands in in one respect, um, you know, just as an act of aggression contrary to international law and justice, um, mm -hmm. to not being exactly the same things, uh, and and that it could not be allowed to start to stand because it would yeah. set a, an appalling. It would not just be a betrayal of the people of the victims of this aggression, but it would start, set an appalling precedent. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know. That was that. You know, she was. Yeah, as you say, you know, inter international law right. meant something to her. I mean, you know, again, she was she was complicated. I mean, she uh, towards the end of her career, um, she 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 attended. I think it was something called a World Climate Conference or something. This was in 1990, and delivered a speech uh, stressing the importance of both recognizing climate change and taking steps to address it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is not something that you associate with um, conservatives. Um, yeah. Especially American conservatives, of course, um, but you know the, it was a view that she she felt that something ought to be done, and it was better to um, be cautious or to take a view that uh, uh, prudence really mm -hmm. demanded that we uh, take measures to counteract um, the potential consequences mm -hmm. of, of global warming and climate change, even if. Um, uh, some of those consequences failed to play out. Um, mm -hmm. You know that, that we should ensure against the worst. Essentially, um, you know, she saw her, and that was in some ways <coughs> consistent with her her view. She she believed herself to be an advocate of, of prudence and decency and common sense, and um, uh, in some ways risk aversion. Um, uh, albeit there was the the radical free market side to her as well. So you know the, she contained multitudes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like most of the the great politicians, certainly uh, th those who are worth devoting an episode of Blogging Heads to. <laughs> yes, I mean, we don't do it often, and we always wait till they die. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, the, the, yeah. <laughs> let me let me close uh, with this question, um, which just occurred to me actually. Which is what she would have thought of the war launched by George Bush's son, uh, the the Iraq War, which c contrasts mm. with the Persian Gulf War in at least two senses. First of all, 
there was no such clear-cut violation of international law by Iraq that triggered it. I mean, yeah. you can argue how fully in compliance he was with UN resolutions, but by letting the inspectors in and look wherever they wanted, he was like, I would say, easily more than 90 percent in compliance. And he had done nothing like what he had done when he invaded no. Kuwait, A. And B, of course, the war was not legitimized through the cha proper channels of international law, namely mm -hmm. uh, the Security Council. Do you, have you ever thought, like, what would she have thought of that war? Um, because, of course, your prime, yeah. the prime minister you wound up with loved it, at least at the beginning. Well, yeah. Um, I think it's a difficult question. I mean, there are some people who say that if she'd remained prime minister in 1990, you know, because I mean, she was she was toppled in that um, uh, period between Saddam uh, invading Kuwait and um, Operation Desert Storm commencing. Uh, John Major was actually Prime Minister at the time of the war, uh, mm -hmm. in the hot war, the four days of it. Um, there are people who suggest that had she remained in, in power, she might have pressed the Americans to, to uh, move <laughs> beyond the war's initial aims and uh, head to Baghdad, and that we had to get rid of Saddam. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that, that's one of those things that we just you know, can't say, we don't yeah. know. Um, uh, as for the, the, uh, the second Gulf War, <coughs> again, I... I mean, she would have. She would have been. Um, I mean, Afghanistan would have been an easy call for her, um, and would have remained so. Um, the second Gulf War, I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, I suspect that she would have ended up supporting it, um, uh, had she been in power at the time, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, out out but, of regard for the special relationship with uh, America. I, I think so, and I think that. Um, it is certainly possible that she would have viewed, as Blair did, that September 11th, um, the nature of it, um, the scale of it, um, and scale matters uh, in these things, uh, had, had shifted the overall um, calculus mm -hmm. that uh, uh, risks that were previously, um, risks that you could previously live with. Um, mm -hmm. were now not so, it was no longer so comfortable to live with them. Uh, I, I, I can see that she might have taken that view as well. Um, okay. But, um, you know, it's a fairly in, in, imponderable uh, <laughs> question. Um, you had the chance there to convert me into a big Margaret Thatcher fan by affirming that she definitely would have opposed the Iraq War. But I'm well, she might have. She might have. But, but I mean, I really, I really <laughs> don't know. I mean, uh, you know, she, you know, she was not very good at gazing into other people's souls, and I, I'm not sure how useful it is to gaze into hers in, in respect to this, at least. She would, so um, she would not have looked at, at, at uh, into Putin's eyes and said, as, as George Bush uh, the younger did. Uh, I, I have seen into his soul, or whatever the hell ridiculous I think, thing he said. I think we can be pretty sure that she would not have done so. She might have said we can not, do business would, with him, but she, she would, would not, not have, have said. I, she would not have approved of Mr. Putin mm -hmm. either, um, I think. I, you know, I mean, Thatcher was, you know, she was, again, a, a complicated um, uh, character. I mean, she was, uh, uh, there was a great uh, a line that somebody came up with the other day that, you know, she had hoped that Britain would be like her father, who was an, mm -hmm. uh, an alderman, a local government, um, a councillor in, in provincial Lincolnshire and Grantham, where she grew up and where she was born. Uh, uh, you know, God-fearing, Methodist, um, uh, hard-working, prudent, uh, thrifty. Uh, and instead, you know, so she hoped that Britain would be in her father's image, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And then... Uh, thanks in but in fact, in thanks in large part to some of the policies she pursued, um, deregulation of the financial sector, for instance, um, which transformed London, um, made London once again a global capital for finance, uh, rivaling New York, having spent 20 or 30 years being eclipsed by New York. Mm -hmm. um, instead, you know, Britain ended up being rather like her, her son, somewhat feckless, spendthrift, um, playboy with dodgy associations um, in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, and in, in some ways, her vision of what Britain should be um, uh, is not how Britain has turned out to be. The consequences of her uh, premiership, both in terms of economic terms uh, and, and socially, have, have not been what she would have foreseen. I mean, she was a, an economic liberal, but a social conservative. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that she ever really appreciated the tension between those two things. Um, the economic liberalism uh, spawns social liberalism as well, I think. Mm -hmm. um, the, the contradictions, and, uh, of, contradictions yeah, and, and, of capitalism. Yeah, uh, and, and so, you know, her, her, her legacy is, is a Britain that is um, more relaxed in many ways, kinder mm -hmm. in some ways, uh, certainly a more tolerant place. Um, mm -hmm. 
uh, but also multicolored, uh, polyglot, uh, multi-religious uh, mm -hmm. in some ways. Well, the Christianity is in decline, but other religions are, are thriving. Um, you know, that, that it is a very different place to that of 1979, which looks quite monochrome in comparison uh, to Britain today. And many of those developments she would not have welcomed. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, they are part of her legacy as well. I mean, she, mm -hmm. in the late 60s, she voted um, to, in favor of decriminalizing homosexuality, um, mm -hmm. which was, you know, quite courageous for a conservative MP to do at the time. Mm -hmm. But she would not, it is difficult to believe that she would have been in favor of gay marriage. Um, and she certainly would oh. not have been in favor of large-scale immigration. Although almost no one who's in favor of it now was in favor of it back then, you know. So well, no, that's true. That's you true. Never know. But uh, you know, she, um, you know, her, her great mission was defeating um, socialism at home and, mm -hmm. and abroad, of course, in some ways. Um, uh, and in that, she prevailed. Um, but in doing so, um, you know, the triumph of market liberalism had un unintended or unforeseen consequences in terms of the social arena, many of which I think she would have disapproved mm -hmm. of, but that are actually a large part of her legacy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for all these insights, Alex. I will leave you to work through the remaining stages of your <laughs> well, grief. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, I, I, I mean, hope uh, I've helped. I, ho I hope this has been uh, cathartic or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no. It's been fun. It's been fun. I mean, she, you know, one of the things that you see is, is a slight sense of awe about her, even on the left. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, she was, the celebrations she was one of, a of kind. her demise have been rather more muted than some people expected or anticipated. Um, and I think that's just because, you know, she does, certainly re she remains a divisive figure, but she is a figure of such consequence of a sort that we don't actually see all that often. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can argue that the you know four most consequential British prime ministers of the 20th century were David Lloyd George, Clement Attlee, Winston Churchill, and Margaret Thatcher. Um, you know, so we don't have these sorts of people coming around all that often. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know, uh, none of her successors have faced challenges. Um, anything like as daunting or as significant or as vital as those she did. Um, yeah. And so they are still, uh, you know, the Thatcherite shadow still casts um, itself over British politics. I mean, we are still in the, uh, in the era of Thatcher. It may be drawing to an, aim, an end, but uh, we certainly don't know what comes next. But, you know, if we had done the era of Attlee from 45 to 79, 79 to 2013 is certainly the age of Thatcher. And we're about to for a new age. And but we don't know what it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank. Well, thanks again, Alex. And uh, I hope you won't wait until the next death of an epic figure to come back. And talk no. Well, I mean, I hope, I hope not. Any time. Any time. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Excellent. Thank you, Bob.